Hi everyone, welcome back to Project 2845. I've been thinking about uh, and kicking around some ideas for the power supply. And since we need, you know, a pretty strong, healthy voltage swing on the grids of the output tubes, we're gonna need a, a preamp voltage of around 500 volts to start with on the driver. I'm looking at an arrangement here using a traditional bridge rectifier, and typically uh, with this center tap transformer, you can derive a positive, negative, and zero volt supply, so a bipolar supply. However, what I was looking at is using this same arrangement, but by grounding the low side, we can create a, essentially a V mid rail and a V out rail uh, for the full voltage. So if this is a thousand volts, say, the mid is going to sit right at 500 volts relative to our ground node. This seems pretty convenient and uh, pretty economical because with one rectifier, and I've been thinking about using, uh, again, I'm showing diodes here. I may use a tube in the high positions. Um, I may use a diode. I'm not entirely sure here. But with the economy of a single rectifier, we can get the two real voltage rails we need for the entire amplifier. That's at least the thinking. How this works is the center tap obviously is sitting at the mid of the of the transformer. So if we've got a thousand volt winding, when the high when the top side of the uh, transformer's at a thousand volts, we get five hundred volts in our center tap and zero here. And through the rectifier arrangement, this current is pushed into the mid rail. This current is obviously pushed into the high side under the top of the cap here. And likewise, the same when the polarity, the AC swing goes negative, we've got 1,000 volts again across the transformer. This is still sitting at 500 volts relative to this opposite side. And again, based on the bridge rectifier arrangement, the 1,000 volts again will be conducted through that path there back up on top of our cap. So that's all well and good. Another requirement for this amplifier is to use inductive filters. Now here, uh, I drew them on the low side, and I'll talk about that in a second. But the reason we really want to use filter chokes is to create a relatively stiff supply with adequate filtering uh, on the plates of our um, 845 tubes. Because it's a single-ended amp, the output stage has very little PSRR, so we need a lot of filtering. So a, a CL, CLC type filter, so two pi filters, seems adequate. And appropriately set up, we should be getting hundreds of microvolts of RMS ripple on our high voltage supply. The chokes here are drawn on the low side because with a thousand volt or 1.1, 1 1.2 kilovolt supply, if these inductors are on the high side, the coils are sitting at that nominal high side DC voltage. However, these chokes are gonna be bolted onto a case which must be earthed for safety. So the voltage differential between the coil and the core is gonna be that full supply voltage. That will stress the insulation and could potentially be dangerous, and these chokes would have really have to be appropriately designed with an insulation package designed to withstand, you know, 1.1 kilovolts plus a pretty healthy safety margin. You know, the peak here is going to be maybe one, you know, if this is a thousand volt transformer, 1,000 times square root of two is our peak voltage here, so that'd be 1,400 volts. So we need at least that plus an additional safety margin of insulation between the coil and the case or the or the the core of this filter choke. That's a pretty substantial requirement and it's going to be very hard to meet that and or expensive to build a filter choke that meets that requirement. So a much safer thing to do is actually move these chokes to the low side and then our ground reference is actually after the chokes here the DC current flowing through this low side back to the, the rectifier and whatever AC voltage drop is across these inductors due to the filtering is gonna appear here. So this node is gonna float around relative to ground and it's gonna actually swing below ground 
with whatever DC voltage drop across the inductors due to the output current plus the voltage drop instantaneous ripple voltage drop across each inductor. So this node's going to be bouncing around pretty aggressively. That's okay. A little more analysis is needed though when we add this V mid rail. So the idea was if I split my filtering into two sets of capacitors, you know, or it could be four, that way I have a, a perfect center point, I can put my V mid rail out here and share on the low side these common chokes. So essentially on the 1.1 kilovolt supply and my 550 volt mid rail supply for my preamp, I'm sharing filtering, which seems pretty economical. By the way, for some of the simulations, I've been using this uh, tool. Uh, this is Tina TI, which is TI or Texas Instruments own SPICE tool. Um, I've shown a quad of five AR4 GZ34 rectifiers on the left. I'm not sure if I'm gonna go that route yet, but really what I'm interested in with this arrangement is trying some experiments where I'm looking at, let's see if my mouse will show up. Trying some arrangements here where I'm looking at really the ripple voltage and current into these main filter caps. These see majority of the ripple because we've got our peak EAC coming in and then from the choke, although again, it's drawn on the low side, we're gonna be filtering that out. So this V mid, uh, this v -mid rail seems pretty clever. And again, economical where we can share filter choke and filter 550 volts or our mid rail and our, our top rail simultaneously. However, after some further analysis, and again with help of the SPICE tools, this doesn't really work as we expect. And basically, if I take this circuit and redraw it, C2 and C4 here end up being in parallel with each other. This net is has to be all the same voltage, right? It's a wire. So we end up getting something that actually looks like this from a filtering perspective. What ends up happening is we end up really only filtering the ripple on half of the supply between the positive in the center tap or the negative in the center tap. C2 in parallel with C4 are really just withstanding, again, half the voltage. So we've got 500 volts of DC across C2 and C4, and then another 500 volts to the top, which is our, our V out full rail. So really what happens with this arrangement is we're only filtering half of the supply, which really leads to inefficient use of our filter choke. We're not filtering our full V full um, rail. We're only filtering essentially half of it. So we've got half ripple component riding on top of a half DC component. So we effectively have half the filtering capacity that we would otherwise have without this net in place. The other thing I wanted to document here before we move on is because the voltage developed across L1, the ripple voltage due to the um, inductive, the inductive effect of L1 is across here in C3. In this arrangement, C1 actually sees all of the ripple current and ripple voltage. And again, simulations also prove this to be true. So um, it's something to be aware of if you're looking at doing this type of arrangement and you have filtering up here, uh, C1 will see all of the ripple. Now, I should also mention, it's not to say this is ineffective, but Again, it's half as good as it could be uh, if we've removed this V mid rail net. Um, we're filtering again only half the voltage. So we get some filtering benefit of L1, but if we're paying for the cost of a, of a filter choke, we might as well get the full benefit of it. Especially again, we want this uh, power supply to be very clean. It's a single ended amp with very little PSRR. This is some simulations I ran just showing uh, uh, with and without that V-mid rail that I have dotted. And then I tap off the V-mid rail here for my filtering, my additional filtering and, and RC voltage dropping for the preamp. What's interesting is with, again, with this V-mid rid, rail, we see all the voltage ripple across that lower first cap, which is as we expect. If we remove V mid rail, 
we'll see the voltage ripple shared between those two caps. What's a little interesting is if I remove this V-mid rail and I don't touch these capacitance values, the capacitance halves because I've got two caps now in series across this entire line. So actually my ripple voltage doubles compared to with this V-mid rail across this entire stack. Again, that makes sense because we're now filtering from the positive all the way to the negative. But each cap sees actually the same ripple voltage as with this V-mid rail on this cap alone because we're splitting this ripple voltage equally now between two caps. So just kind of an interesting note, I was scratching my head on why the simulations were shown with this V-mid rail removed, why I see now the exact same ripple voltage and current appear across two caps. Um, but after a little bit of thinking, that seems to make sense. And these are just the results. This is showing how, uh, it may be hard to see the lines, but cap uh, current and voltage on that top cap Again, uh, no ripple voltage or very little ripple voltage or current, but that bottom cap is seeing majority. And look, we're getting 779 milliamps peak to peak. And that's just a function because the voltage is so high. So we're gonna get a lot of ripple current through that bottom cap. Removing the V-mid rail shows now essentially the same result. We now see that ripple voltage and current across both caps. And again, by removing V-mid, that entire capacitance across the stack I showed earlier is halved. I've got 10 microfarads and 10 microfarads. Without this V-mid rail, effectively I got five microfarads. So I double the ripple voltage, but per cap it's halved because I'm now sharing it equally across two caps. This is a page documenting uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, I'm actually Coming up with a comparison between this V-mid rail and the ripple current and voltage developed across the single cap versus across the stack. And so per cap, the ripple voltage or, 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 or the, the capacitance that the majority of the ripple current sees is the same in this scenario with 10 microfarads on top as 220 microfarads across the entire voltage. What's interesting is the ripple current is still the same, but the ripple voltage is halved. I still have 10 microfarads across my equivalent voltage I'm pumping current through. So I still see the same amount of ripple current, but I now have two caps so I'm essentially just doing a division of two for the ripple voltage across each cap. This scenario is essentially removing the V-mid and leaving the capacitance alone. And what I see is 2x the total ripple voltage across here, because my capacitance is halved. I get five microfarads now essentially across this. Um, but my ripple current per cap is still the same as what I would see above. So it's a little bit of an odd scenario. You have to kind of wrap, it took me a little while to wrap my head around what was going on here and why during my different simulations I was seeing what appeared to be the same ripple voltage and currents as my first scenario with and without V-mid. But really it's just, it's, again, it's a voltage division effect or the fact that if I just remove V-mid rail, I see now half the capacitance but I split up the ripple voltage due to these uh, resistors sharing the voltage, equally sharing or balancing the voltage across each capacitor. So how about some other topologies with this arrangement? Is there a way we can get this to work and still share L1 and or L2 on the low side? So here's an arrangement where I said, okay, well, what if I bring it out here, I center tap, uh, my full voltage stack here so I get voltage balancing and then I bring it out independently and add my filtering out here relative to ground. This is actually sort of like the same problem but even worse because now I've got L1 and L2 DC voltage and ripple voltage appearing across C2. Again this node has to maintain the voltage so I basically get the voltage drop across this capacitor, this inductor, and this inductor folded over and appearing across C2. It makes the problem way worse. And I actually drew it out here, um, how this arrangement effectively looks like this across C2. 
got C1 on top, C2 on the bottom, and then that tapping point, I've got a bunch of voltage drops, which again are noisy, carrying ripple current. So C2 has to deal with all of that, which actually increases, compared to that previous arrangement, the requirements of C2 uh, quite significantly. Here's a different arrangement. What if I don't bring my mid rail out to my center point and treat it completely independently? Well, it turns out this is really no good either. I end up having two paths that share a common impedance on L1. Again, this is all assuming L1's low side. I, that's a requirement um, I'm imposing on this design for a thousand volt power supply, and I think that's a very safe one to do. I would not recommend putting a filter choke on a full thousand volt, in series with a full thousand volt line. That's just doesn't, from a safety perspective and longevity perspective of that filter choke, it's, it's, not, it's not really advisable. But with this arrangement, now I've got ripple from my V mid and ripple from my full rail pushed through this L1 inductor. So I've got crosstalk essentially between these two different loops. So this is gonna bump around V full. I've got two moving power supplies, two noisy power supplies stacked on top of each other. And keep in mind the phase between these ripples is also different because the filtering is not necessarily the same. So it, you can get, you know, very noisy, not just 60 cycle hum, but you can get, you know, harmonics of 60 cycles depending on the phase difference between these two phases and how the noise adds up or cancels across that inductor. So that doesn't work either. The only way this arrangement really does work is if I move my inductor to the high side. So in that case, this arrangement will work and you will get a half voltage and a full voltage and you can filter this voltage relative to my ground point point. and again now this entire bus is ground and the reason is is I'm not sharing common impedance this also does highlight why in power supply design you know having long wires between different supplies that are sharing currents will develop the same problem you know if I go back to my previous page if we assume this L is very small and just inductance due to wiring, we have the same sort of problem, but it's minimized. Obviously, L1 in this case might be a 6 to 10 Henry stroke, so that's a really massive voltage drop in common impedance. But the same story goes for here. Our wiring here should be well controlled, and we need to think about how these currents are going to cascade to minimize this and make each of these supplies as clean as possible. However, as I mentioned before, I do not want to put a filter choke on the high side, so this arrangement for my requirements will not work either. If I was doing a lower voltage supply, I might try this, but for a thousand volts or over a thousand volts, um, I think this arrangement is out. The last thing I want to comment on this that I've been thinking about is, again, Moving the inductor to the low side can be done, not a problem, as long as I ground, and actually I didn't draw it in there, but my ground point is here. This node is moving around relative to earth ground. One thing that we do have to consider on startup is voltage drop across this inductor can make this node go negative and essentially reverse bias this capacitor for a very short period of time on startup. And again, if you do some simulations, they'll show this as well. If you just measure the voltage across this bottom, a C2 capacitor. So it's something to be aware of. So C2 and C1 should be sized appropriately for the uh, inductance value used to try to m ensure that this doesn't go negative, especially if you're using you know, an aluminum electrolytic capacitor. One way around that, again, is sizing these appropriately, but if we want to be extra safe, we can, we can make C1 and C2 maybe a film cap. And since these capacitors need to be lower in value anyway, because it's right after our rectifier and we, want to, we don't want to stress our rectifier too badly, film caps are probably a good idea. And they can handle the uh, pretty high ripple currents that we saw earlier much better than an aluminum electrolytic capacitor can. Uh, their ESR and dissipation factor are much better than electrolytic capacitor. So that's something to keep in mind regardless of if I use that V mid rail, which it looks like based on this analysis, I'm not going to. But anytime you put a inductor on the low side and you're stacking capacitors in this manner, this node can fall below ground quicker than this node charges up to keep 
the total polarity across the capacitor in the correct orientation. Anyway, I hope that was uh, instructional for some of you. I, it took me quite a while and again, a lot, of, uh, a lot of simulations to get that figured out. But for this design, I'm gonna abandon then, you know, as we started with this series, I'm gonna completely abandon, I guess, this split rail design. It's not to say that it won't work, it's just with the components and the, inspect and the expensive inductors we want to use, we're not getting the full benefit and we're not getting as clean of a power supply as we could be. So my guess uh, as to right now, as far as how this design is probably going to play out, is I'm going to do a separate 1000 volt supply and uh, a separate approximately 500 volt supply for the preamp. And that way I can filter both of those appropriately. Thanks for watching and take care. Thank you.